my shoes and out the door. Five, I'm alive, six, seven, eight, feeling great. Hey all, it's Dr. Noah. A little teaser for you loyal podcast listeners. On May 20th, we are offering our first two projects, which happen to be online summits at an incredible price. You will be able to purchase either the Pain Relief Project, Natural Solutions That Actually Work, or the Longevity and Anti-Aging Project for an awesome price of $17 each, normally $97. Or you can purchase them both for $27. That's nearly 60 interviews with some of the greatest minds in the health and wellness field today, like Rob Wolf, Dave Asprey, Sayer G, Dr. Terry Walls, and Mark Sisson, to name a few. Trust me, their messages and information are as timely today as they were when we did the interviews a few short years ago. The cart opens May 20th and will remain open until June 3rd. Stay tuned in. The link to take advantage of this incredible offer will be available very, very soon. Enjoy the upcoming podcast. Hello, BYWG Tribe. This is Dr. Noah. We wanted to make you aware of our exciting product, book, and supplement of the month for May 2019. Keep in mind, all the links, discount codes, and special offers for the product, book, and supplement will be listed in the show notes and iTunes, posted on social media, in our weekly newsletter, and on our website at www.beyondyourwildestgenes.com at the Listen Now tab. So let's start with the exciting news first. Each and every month, from this month going forward, we are going to, in addition to having the book of the month and product of the month, we're also going to feature a supplement of the month as well. So let's start here first. Layering on top of the exciting news, we have just formulated a brand new supplement, literally a few weeks ago. Got it into production, and now we can offer it up to you, as it addresses something we talk about all the time, and that's the all-important sleep. The new formula is called BYWG's Deep Sleep Assist. This is a specialized combination of scientifically backed herbs, adaptogens, minerals, and amino acids that help you get to sleep, stay asleep, and achieve deeper levels of sleep so you wake rested and renewed. And for those of you who are sensitive to melatonin, this formula is melatonin-free. The 10% discount code for May is SLEEP10. It's case-sensitive, so it's capital S, lowercase l, E-E-P, 10. Our May product of the month is a return product, something that I am a huge fan of and have done three times so far. That's the Prolon Fasting Mimicking Diet. This five-day plan includes all the food you need for a five-day fast in which you are still eating food, about 600-plus calories a day, and at the same time getting all the benefits of fasting. I love it as a reset. I love it the way it makes me feel, and I love all the other benefits fasting offers. Prolon actually has a Mother's Day and Women's Wellness Month promotion running from May 1st to May 13th that you can all take advantage of by using the link below. The promo includes $25 off a Prolon kit, free shipping, and a free copy of the Longevity Diet Book. If you miss this by any chance, from May 14th to the end of the month, using the same link listed below and the code capital B, capital Y, capital W, capital G for a single box or for a subscription, capital B, capital Y, capital W, capital G, lowercase s, you will receive 10% off your Prolon kit. The best way to learn more about Prolon FMD is to listen to the podcast I did with Dr. Joel Kahn that was released on June 18, 2018 in the archives on our website at www.beyondyourwildestgenes.com, or the most recent listen will be with, will be with Dr. Felice Gersh that will be released May 13, 2019. Our book of the month is the Essential Oils Hormone Solution, Reclaim Your Energy, Focus, and Lose Weight Naturally by Dr. Maritza Snyder. And you could listen to Dr. Wanda Lee's interview with the author in the BYWG podcast archives on the March 25th, 2019 release. Be awesome and never unawesome. Enjoy the upcoming podcast. Hello and welcome back to Beyond Your Wildest Genes podcast. My name is Dr. Noah DeCoyer and I'm your co-host. Today I'm super excited to have Dr. Felice Gersh as our guest today. We have an extremely uh, interesting topic. You know, we're all about genetics and epigenetics. Uh, that's why we're called Beyond Your Wildest Genes. And we're going to talk about male-female differences, sex chromosomes matter, 
Uh, we're going to finish off um, talking a little bit about uh, the doc's new book and a little bit about the fasting mimicking diet, Prolon, which uh, we've partnered with in the past as well. So welcome, Dr. Gersh. Is it okay if I run through your bio first and then we'll dive right in? Sounds like a good plan. All right. Uh, Dr. Gersh is a double board certified in OBGYN, integrative medicine. She received her undergraduate degree from Princeton University and her medical degree from the University of South California Medical School of Medicine. This was followed by a four-year internship and residency in OBGYN at Kaiser Hospital in Los Angeles. More recently, she completed a two-year fellowship program in integrative medicine at the University of Arizona School of Medicine. She specializes in all aspects of female health with a particular focus in on managing female hormone dysfunctions. In addition to many national and international speaking engagements, she works full-time as the medical director of the Integrative Medical Group of Irvine. She served many years as the assistant clinical professor of OBGYN at the Keck UCS School of Medicine and currently serves as a consultative faculty member with a fellowship in integrative medicine at the University of Arizona School of Medicine. Holy moly, you are highly decorated. Dr. Gersh has been awarded membership <laughs> in the Medical Honor Society Alpha Omega Alpha, named the Outstanding Volunteer Faculty for the OBGYN Department at the UCS Keck School of Medicine and identified as a physician of excellence for Orange County 16 years in a row. She has recently completed her first book, PCO, PCOS, SOS, it's a great name, a gynecologist's lifeline to natural restore your rhythms, hormones, and happiness, which is now available for purchase on Amazon. Whew. Audience, near the end of the podcast, we're also going to chat a little bit about fasting and the Prolon FMD. We have partnered with Prolon in the past, and if you're interested in the five-day kit to get all the benefits of fasting while still eating, after listening to our discussion with Dr. Gersh, we have a special offer for you, 10% off single kits. Uh, the code is BYWG, and for subscriptions, it's BYWGS. The link will be in the show notes in our weekly newsletter. Whew. First thing first, Doc, since you're the, this is the first time you're on our show, how about just fleshing out your bio a little bit more for our audience, make it a little bit more real um, so they just get a feel for who you are. Sure. Well, I am a working doc. I have my brick and mortar practice where, like you mentioned, I am the medical director, but every day I see my patients, the vast majority are women, but I do see some of their husbands because they don't know where to turn for health care. Mm -hmm. And so I really have a, a mission of caring for patients one on one. But because I view things a little differently than the average OBGYN doctor, and I'm, I also take care of men because I have, the, like you mentioned, the, the double board certification. I have the extra fellowship in integrative medicine, so I do care for men as well. But because I have a different view, I really wanted to have a voice. I really wanted to get out there and help women, even the ones that can't come and see me. So that's why I started doing a lot of lecturing. So I lecture at medical conferences all over the U.S. and around the world, which has given me wonderful opportunities to meet so many people and have lots of adventures. And then it was time for me to get my first book out. So I'm hoping to have one every single year from this point on. And I have so much content from all the, the lectures I've created. And one of my really big missions is to change the way that doctors and patients look at women's health care, that we cannot keep covering up problems by basically trying to get rid of their hormones by doing like things like putting them on birth control pills or drugs that take away their ability to make hormones, that we have to look for underlying root causes of female health problems, which are really rampant these days, just just horrendous. And, and looking at the differences between males and females, which is one of the reasons I was so excited to be on your podcast today to talk about the innate differences that go way back to the very moment of conception, and uh, which people aren't looking at. In fact, the vast majority of research has been done on males, very little on females, because women are very, much more complicated than males are. So we really don't have much data on women. So we need to start accumulating data, but we must recognize the need for this. And that's why recognizing the innate differences between males and females is sort of the foundation of, of starting a starting point from which to develop new ideas and, and new paradigms for the approach to women's health care as perhaps different, you know, from male health care. Yeah, yeah. So, so let's start there. Let's do a little bit of an XY chromosome uh, 101 for us, leading into uh, some of the fundamental differences between males and females like you discussed. So uh, XY 101, shoot. 
Okay, so way back, about oh, 166 million years ago, <laughs> there that was the beginning of the sex chromosomes. And, you know, they don't probably get quite the, the due and respect that they deserve because they are very instrumental in becoming the person that you are, whether you're a male or a female. So way back, way back about that time, that's when the Y chromosome started to differentiate from the, the typical autosome type of a chromosome. And it's very interesting. So it actually developed the lack of ability to have a crossover. So it could no longer make exchanges between other chromosomes. And so what happened is that many of the genes became mutated. And ultimately, over time, many of these genes became deleted. But there was, in the very beginning, though, there was the recombination before this sort of event happened, and a very special gene developed on the Y chromosome called the SRY. And this particular gene enabled men to become perfect men. They, they were the, that's the gene that enabled the development of the testes that you know, amazing type of organ that males have so that they can make the testosterone. So this amazing difference is imprinted in all male Y chromosomes. So what happened is because there was no longer the ability to have the crossover and exchange the genetic material, many of the genes became mutated. And ultimately, you had this very, very long, long chromosome with a lot of really bad genes. And ultimately, nature being as amazing as it is with evolution, over millions of years, many of these genes, these really mutated genes, were deleted. So the Y chromosome is much, much smaller than the X chromosome. So it's just this little chromosome, but it's very special because it has that SRY but it's not just we re we thought until recently that this particular gene, the SRY, was only about male differentiation and the creation of the testes. But now we know that it's much more than that. Every time we think something is whatever it is, it, we're always very off track because it's always more complicated. So it turns out that like this particular gene is elsewhere. For example, it's in the brain. It's doing things that go far beyond just the sexual differentiation. So there are many diseases now we know have different um, prevalences between males and females. And this particular gene is very critical to that. Meanwhile, you had a problem now developing because you had this very long X chromosome and this very short Y chromosome. So that's a very big mismatch. And then in females, you now had two very long X chromosomes, which have the same genes would be replicated. Of course, one would be from the mom and one be, would be from the dad. So this incredible process developed where you would have one of the genes would become quieted, right? So, and that's a whole really amazing process. And then as well, we would then have some of the genes actually on the quieted X chromosome actually did not get quieted. So that creates another whole dynamic of differences that are built into males and females right from the get-go. And Okay, so this sets up the differences. And I, I, this is a fascinating conversation. So as we progress through these millions of years and we start producing these sex hormones, what can be attributed now to the sex chromosomes as opposed to the different sex hormones? Like, how, how, where is that differentiated? Oh, that is such a great question because it's very difficult in a human to make that differentiation because even in utero, once these chromosomes get started and, and the, the body becomes developed and you start having the cells grow and multiply, Sex hormones are actually made by the embryo in the uterus. So while the, you know, during the fetal life. So it's really, really hard to differentiate on a lot of these different factors because the hormones and the genes have this amazing, of course, interplay. But what has been found is that early, early, early in embryonic development, before the second X chromosome is quieted, that you have a multitude of genes that are actually active. 
and that there's a very substantial difference between male embryos and female embryos in their ability to perform such functions that I'm sure you've talked about, with uh, like acetylation and methylation. So before you get these changes where you have one X chromosome that gets quieted, you actually have a more robust kind of a process going on. So the fetal brains of males and females even before any hormones come into the scene, are actually different. So males and females have different brains right from the get-go. So, And then, of course, using mice. We can't do this with humans. Using mice, you can actually take out the gonads so there are no sex hormones being produced. And you can actually transplant from a male to the female. And they, when they've done a lot of these really interesting experiments, they have found behavioral differences between males and females, even when you take sex hormones completely out of the picture. So we are different, and we should celebrate our differences. And you know, the, the reason I'm so interested in a lot of the male-female differences is because I grew up during the very beginning phases of what was then called feminism. Mm -hmm. And we were, so we were like, okay, women have been, you know, not given the same opportunities as males. So it went sort of overboard saying, well, women are the same as men. And, you know, so then they had these commercials where women would be wearing, you know, three piece suits and a tie and they would be acting just like a male. And you know, we went overboard. So we need to go back to our literally our beginnings and try to understand the foundations of differences between males and females so that we can approach their health care and and sort of appreciate these things in, in children. So they found that, you know, there are significant differences between males and females from the moment of conception concerning survival. So even during the fetal stage of life, males have a higher mortality rate than females at every stage of life from the very beginning to the very end, no matter how long it goes out, females tend to have greater rates of survival than males. And then you can look at, well, from a functional point of view, why would this be more important? Why would we evolve this way? Because everything seems to have a purpose, and the purpose is survival for the purpose of reproduction. Yeah. So that is the, the prime directive of life is reproduction, and humans are the only species on the planet that really tries to control their reproductive destiny. You know, you take a bunch of dogs together or cats together, they're not going to think about, you know, their career options. You know, they just, they'll mate, right? So, you know, but that's how we evolved. We evolved to mate and, and have babies and, and survive. And just think about this. If you had um, like an, a massive epidemic, which of course has happened through the history of, of mankind, and you had 10 males survive for every female, where would that get us? You know, that would be a, a problem. So, but if you had this terrible epidemic and you had 10 females survive to every male, then the human species could continue, right? So everything is for a purpose, for the purpose of reproduction and survival. So I think nature built in this uh, greater ability for females to survive for that very purpose so that if you had to, if you had to choose, you'd have more females on the planet than males. And, and uh, that's just how it would be for a short period, a short period of time. That, that's a, a, f a fascinating way to look at things. I mean, even we know now that the, the, the female brain, I, I believe because of estrogen, is even protected from uh, – or uh, protected or have lower autism rates because of their different hormones. Am I, I'm correct on saying that as well, right? Well, absolutely. There's a dramatic difference in the incidence of autism between males and females. And it probably goes back to the fetal brain, that the female brain is better at performing acetylation and methylation from, from the get-go. And then, yes, estrogen. I mean, I talk endlessly on estrogen, the uh, the beautiful hormone that I have to defend everywhere I go because it's not well understood. And, you know, a lot of people say the less estrogen, the better. And it's like, well, that is a very inappropriate way of thinking about it because estrogen is very key to brain health. Absolutely. Women before the age, the time of menopause have tremendous advantages in brain protection. For example, if there's 
a stroke or brain trauma, females do better than males because estrogen helps modulate the whole function of the microglia and the uh, immune system of the brain to allow a better um, control of inflammation and healing. Estrogen is all about healing. People don't realize that. If you get a big gash or wound on your arm, what makes you heal? It's actually estrogen. Estrogen's even made in the skin. Of course, that's how men get lots of estrogen. They make it on site. So estrogen is about controlling the platelets, which stop the bleeding, and then it creates all these growth factors, creates new blood vessels, and creates new tissue so that you can heal that wound. So I think of estrogen as the mother hormone. It's about growth and nurturing, proliferation. But if you have an inflamed person, which nowadays so many people are chronically inflamed, not a state that we were ever designed to be in, then poor estrogen is working overtime trying to deal with all this inflammation. And should you be so unlucky as to start having chromosome breakage, you know, you start having DNA breakage and problems, and then you end up with cancer because chronic inflammation is a the perfect breeding ground for developing cancer, then poor estrogen was not evolved to deal with cancer. Cancer is like a modern disease. And so it's trying to nurture the estrogen receptor positive type cancers. It doesn't understand it's cancer. It's, it thinks it's doing its job. It's like nurturing and, and helping and creating new growth of cancer. But it's not. It's just taking the beautiful natural function of estrogen and sort of um, subverting it by creating chronic inflammation and cancer. So we need to sort of understand, you know, how things go wrong and then try to get to the root cause of why it's going wrong rather than taking away estrogen, <laughs> that, that people don't really understand poor estrogen. But um, estrogen is one of, the, of course, the key reasons that males and females are different. But um, it's, it's so fascinating when you start dissecting, trying to dissect the differences between the genetics and the sex hormones, which, of course, in real life, we would never have such a situation because they go together so beautifully. But, um, but understanding that from a genetic point of view, we're actually made to survive better than males. Uh, it's just, it's a fascinating thing to, to think about how nature would want that to happen. Oh, I think it, I think it is. You know, Dr. Gers, we've, we've interviewed a lot of prominent docs, sim similar to what you do and what you speak of, not quietly, but uh, quite, but similar. And, and one of the um, misunderstandings that we see over and over again is the, is the role in testosterone in women. People really don't understand that and realize how important testosterone is, not only obviously for men, but it's really important for women as well. Oh, my goodness, yes. I prescribe testosterone. Now, testosterone has um, a different rate of decline than it does estrogen. So estrogen starts to decline during the, the – well, you know, predominantly, of course, during the perimenopause, and then it goes like down off the cliff when you hit menopause. But testosterone is more of a slow decline. But by age 40, the average woman has half the testosterone level she had at age 20. And once again, it's all about nature. It's all about reproduction. So testosterone has many functions in the female body, one of which is involving sexual drive and desire and sexual response. And nature doesn't really want women, once they hit their 40s, to be reproducing. They want them to just raise the kids they have. So it really tries to modulate sexual response and, and desire. But we humans don't want to do that, you know, so we want to change it. So testosterone has that function. But just like estrogen is about the beautiful menstrual cycle and making babies and so on. But it's much more than that because the thing that is so critical that is not well understood is that reproduction and metabolic functions, which is really the metabolic functions are the creation, the storage, the distribution of energy. So I call it the force of life really is what metabolism is. That entire part of the body, the whole everything that has to do with metabolic function and reproduction, they're all one. And of course it's one because nature would not want a female or a male to be reproducing 
if they weren't healthy and capable of having energy stores and the ability to support a pregnancy for a female and, of course, raise that child until that child has reached reproductive maturity. So testosterone, estrogen, they're involved in so, so much more than the sexual reproductive side. So testosterone has receptors all over the body, just like estrogen has receptors all over the body. So testosterone is involved in brain health, bone health, muscle health, or cardiovascular health. So it's involved in everything. So everything is interlinked in this beautiful web of interconnectivity between reproduction and metabolic health, which is all one. It's all one body. So that's why when one thing goes down, because nature linked reproduction to metabolic health, as your reproductive health and reproductive functions go down, so too do your metabolic functions go down. That's why I have to defend testosterone for men too, because like they say, testosterone kills men. No, testosterone keeps men alive and healthy and vibrant and cardiovascular health and metabolic health. These hormones are completely about reproduction and metabolic health. And so testosterone is a very critically important hormone for women across the board. About It's involved in every function in the body in some fashion. I uh, couldn't agree more. So I think we might, might have answered this question already, uh, but – why do women statistically live longer than men? Well, that that is the biggest question ever that we can't totally answer. But in terms in terms of if we get back to the very beginnings, right? So we know that imprinted into the female brain, there there this this improvement in say it's these different functions, acetylation, methylation. So we do have better brains and. I don't want to say that. That sounds bad. We don't want to say that women have better brains. We, we have better you brains. Oh, no. I, I want to, yes, uh, <laughs> we have better brains for survival, we'll say. Just, you know, and um, different brains. So we do have this incredible survival advantage. Now, one of that, one of the reasons that we think that happens that goes beyond that is that women have double X. We have two X chromosomes. Now, one of the X chromosomes is deactivated, and this is a random process that occurs in every cell in the body. Well, it turns out that women have one X chromosome from their dad and one X chromosome from their mom. So this inactivation of one of the X chromosomes allows what we would call mosaicism. So we never know in any particular cell, is that the mom's X chromosome that's working in you, or is that the dad's X chromosome? But because you have this blend of chromosomes from both, you have sort of like a double coverage. That's why sex-linked diseases almost never manifest in women, because half of their of their X chromosomes are coming from the other party, the other parent, and so it helps to cover up the problem of the bad, the bad gene. So we have double coverage. You know, we have the benefit of the good genes from our mom and the good genes from our dad. When you only get the X chromosome from your mom, any bad genes that she has on that X chromosome as a guy, that's the only one you get. You don't have like this backup X chromosome that can have the, the good one that can overcome the bad one from that one mom that you have that gave you the, as a guy that X chromosome. The, so you have this replication and the most beautiful and obvious way that you can understand Understand this mosaicism is the calico cat. So a calico cat is always going to be a girl cat. And what it is, it's a blend where one of the parents was a black cat and one of the parents was an orange cat. And then randomly, one of the genes, one of the X chromosomes is turned off in each of the cells. So you end up with approximately half of the cat being orange and approximately half of the cat being black in a very random fashion. And so that sort of is a, the perfect manifestation of what happens in, in every female where one of the X chromosomes is deactivated. But it gets even more complicated because it turns out that about 15% of the genes on the deactivated X chromosome are actually not deactivated. They're still live. So we actually have about 15% duplicates 
that are actually live at all times. And it turns out that many of those X chromosome genes that are not deactivated on the quieted one actually are involved in immune health. So actually that's one of the reasons why females have a dramatically more robust immune system than do males. So at every stage of life, females are more likely to survive sepsis. And males are more likely, even in childhood, at every, like in, in children, males are more prone to getting viral infections, bacterial infections, and meningitis, and so on, than females. So females have the benefit of the X chromosomes from both parents, just in a random fashion, depending on which cells they have activated. And also about 15% of their X chromosomes actually are not deactivated, even on the quieted X chromosome, and they're all about immune health. So we are actually evolved to be much better at de dealing with infections, and we have this resilience by having this blend, this mosaicism of our X chromosomes. Holy moly. That's an unbelievable answer. Wow. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you for that. <laughs> I thought you were going to just say, oh, it's just a – uh, the, uh, the hormone estrogen that, that allows the women to live a little longer. And boy, oh, boy, that was a heck of a, a more uh, uh, incredible answer. Thank you very, very much. Thank you very much. Uh, well, but uh, don't but don't get the idea that, that estrogen isn't a key player in no, there as well. It, yeah, it right, it is. I know it is. I know it is. Um, so how about telling us a little bit about your new book, PCOS SOS? Well, I'm so excited. It just came out, and this was actually definitely a labor of love. I wrote it with my oldest daughter, Alexis, and both of us actually have PCOS. And Alexis was my first daughter, my first child, and I had PCOS, and I had fertility problems. I had to have fertility treatments and drugs to get pregnant with this amazing daughter of mine. And she had some issues herself, but, you know, we were able to work it through, and then she was able to have her first baby naturally. And we both um, feel very passionately about educating on this topic, and so my, my daughter had um, a, a brilliant um, background in education. She went to Stanford, and, and I finally, I worked and worked on this to get her to become a writer with me. And so we, we came up with this book, which is a totally different approach to PCOS, which is why this book had to be written, because the conventional approach to PCOS, so PCOS stands for polycystic ovary syndrome, the most common endocrine disorder of women. It's actually growing, um, unfortunately, in an epidemic fashion. So depending on, because there's no one actually keeping great statistics, and they have to get it off of coding, which is always inaccurate. So it's basically anywhere from about 15% to even as high as 25% of women will be on, we'll say, on the PCOS spectrum, because it's not just um, one particular manifestation. It has different manifestations and different degrees of severity, but it's a very huge problem for women. Can you imagine waking up and you're a female and you look in the mirror and you're 25 years old and you have terrible cystic acne, your hair on your head is receding and thinning, and you have facial hair and you have to shave every morning and you can't lose weight and you're 50 pounds overweight. I mean, this is, and then you, you have, haven't had a period in six months and you would like to uh, have a career and you want to meet your Prince Charming and you want to have kids and, and this is what you're facing. And this is not atypical. So, you know, it's not a sexy disease. Alexis and I are in the minority. We're what we call lean PCOS, and we were a much milder kind of expression of it. But for a lot of the women, the, the more severe types of manifestations, that's exactly what they live with, and they get blamed, and it's not their fault. It's, it's a huge problem with estrogen in that we are exp – in people who are genetically predisposed – when they're exposed to endocrine disruptors, like the one that's been the most researched is BPA, bisphenol A, which is ubiquitous. Everyone has it in their bodies. Noah, you have it in your body. I know it, unfortunately. And when you're exposed, getting back to genetics, when you're exposed in utero at very critical stages of 
hormone receptor development. You know, everything is programmed in utero, you know, and you can't do a redo and say, oh, let's remake the brain and the receptors. You know, it doesn't work that way. So during critical times when when women are exposed in utero to these endocrine disruptors, it alters the way their receptors for estrogen and their ability to produce estrogen is, is altered in a very negative way. So Although it's manifested in childhood, it really doesn't become tremendously manifested until after puberty when all these things go haywire, essentially. And so the conventional approach is birth control pills, which is actually should be contraindicated because it increases metabolic dysfunction, which is what already is present in women with PCOS, because estrogen is the master of metabolic homeostasis. It regulates all metabolic functions in the body that, that people don't realize because that's the link between reproduction and metabolism is that it's all connected through estrogen. So women with PCOS have reproductive problems and metabolic problems. So the solution is to try to do everything to get their bodies to function more normally. We now know, and maybe you've talked about the circadian rhythm, it actually is regulated by estrogen. So we can use the back door, and, and this is where doing the potential for fasting can be very helpful for women with PCOS because when you do fasting, it's like a reboot to your circadian rhythm and your gut microbiome, and that can really help because women with PCOS, just like women in menopause, are essentially living a life of jet lag. And, of course, we now know that jet lag increases every problem that you can imagine, and that's really what they face. So we, uh, we have a whole program designed to help to naturally help women get back their rhythms, to help their hormones to be functioning the most normally that they can possibly function, and reduce their production of excessive testosterone and other male hormones because of these innate problems with the the function of estrogen. So the, the proper feedback isn't happening and they end up making too much testosterone and they have insulin resistance. So the whole bottom line is it's a very complex condition, but we have a very, very logical and very natural way to help restore the normal functioning of women's bodies with PCOS so they can live the lives that they that they so desire and so deserve. Well, let, well, let me just say two things. One, the, the, the links, when this is released, the link to this book will be in the show notes for sure. And number two, uh, you mentioned you're going to release a book, as you said, every year. Anytime you have a new book um, coming out, make sure you contact us and we'll have you back on to discuss that new book, without a doubt, for sure. Well, that would be wonderful. We're already working on that second book <laughs> together, right. so we're excited for when that will come out. All right, so you just let me know, and we'll take care of that. So you me you mentioned it a little bit on fasting. In, reg in regards to our conversation today, um, we we introduced uh, um, we interviewed Dr. Khan regarding Prolon and FMD, oh, maybe a year or so ago. And I know you're a big fan of fasting, and I and I believe uh, you're uh, you're affiliated in some way with Prolon. Um, how does this fit all into this conversation we um, we discussed today? Because I'm I'm a big fan of Prolon. I do it multiple times a year. My wife does. In fact, April 10th, I'll do my next five day uh, kit. Uh, uh, how does this fit into the conversation we had today? Well, one of the things that I'm going to be advocating for is, of course, doing specific, and we're already beginning it specific studies involving prolon and, and other forms of fasting in women because that's the question. Like, How will women behave differently with fasting than males? One of the things that is very important is that if you're trying actively to get pregnant, then that would not be the time. But if you're planning to get pregnant, like say down the road, in the, like in a year, then you definitely want to do prolon because you're going to improve your metabolic functioning, which is so important. It's, it's so critical for women to be healthy before they get pregnant. We don't put emphasis on that enough. If you want to make a healthy baby, you have to have a healthy mom. So we don't want to just trick women into getting pregnant. We want them to get pregnant naturally because their bodies are healthy. So if you want to prepare for getting pregnant, you want to have the most reduced state of inflammation. We talk about inflammation. We want to have the, the best insulin state in terms of insulin sensitivity. You don't want to have problems with glucose regulation. So most people these days, as you know, have a little bit of excess body fat. They have a little visceral fat epidemic. We have an epidemic of fatty liver. So planning for, a pre for reproductive aged women, 
planning ahead for pregnancy is so important and Fasting with Prolon can be a very big part of that to try to improve your metabolic state. So, But when you're actively at that moment trying to get pregnant, that would not be the time. But everything has its time and its place. Now, for women, when they hit menopause, every woman, unfortunately, when they hit menopause, obviously isn't having estrogen production from their ovaries and the organs of the body that make estrogen, which are very many, which is how men get it, they don't pick up the slack. So women become estrogen deficient and there's just no there's no way around that you can't meditate or exercise or do anything to get out of going through menopause if you're a female you may be able to delay it a couple of years but you're not going to you're not going to escape its inevitability so every woman when she hits menopause is going to become naturally inflamed get dysbiotic gut microbiome. In fact, that's been studied by some researchers at Harvard, so this is not in not debatable. We know that the gut microbiome changes when women go through menopause. They become more inflamed. They have many, many issues. They become high, higher rates of insulin resistance and hypertension. So they become the perfect candidates to try to help maintain metabolic health. So I feel that every woman starting in the perimenopause should definitely be putting Prolon into their um, their toolbox to try to help maintain health. Every woman going through perimenopause and menopause really has to fight for her health. And that's not really talked about enough because in nature – just is what it is. It's about reproduction. Once you're done with the reproductive portion of your life, nature doesn't like give you like a special potion to stay healthy. It takes away your most important hormone, which is estrogen from your, you know, the production from your ovaries. So we women have to fight to stay healthy. And this could be part of our, our toolbox to stay healthy as we transition into menopause and through the years thereafter, up until, you know, you don't want to use it when you're very old and frail. You know, that's where it has to get individualized. And the whole idea is don't get frail. We're all going to get old, but we don't want to get old and frail. So this is my approach to healthy longevity is to do everything in our power to understand nature's toll, you know, that it takes on us when we start losing our hormones and then use every tool that we can possibly access to try to maintain our metabolic state of health. So myself, I've done Prolon 14 times already. I am a huge fan of it. I was the first, um, the first medical practice in the world to incorporate it in my office because we were the, my office was the, the beta test site for Prolon before it even had a name. So I go way back and I, I met with Professor Walter Longo in his lab before the company even existed and um, was part of helping to formulate some of the changes, not in terms of its efficacy, but in terms of consumer likability. So made some modifications to create more variability with the soups and so on, and, um, you know, just uh, did everything to make it so that everyone could use it, enjoy it, you know, with very few exceptions, and, and really be able to get the benefits of, of this amazing process, all the processes that are Trigger. That's my whole thing is we are too dumb to try to micromanage the amazing complexity of the human body. We have to get over it. We can't we can't block this enzyme or this pathway and think that we're doing something great in the long run, because in general, there's going to be a lot of repercussions. That's why every drug has such a long list of side effects. So if we can avoid having to use a lot of drugs, and sometimes you, you can't avoid it, but if we can access our innate abilities to heal through autophagy, through these amazing abilities that the body can access when you trigger these these mechanisms by doing a fasting, like with without having to actually fast by using Prolon, then you can access health without having to go through pharmaceuticals, which always are going to take you down a few paths that you don't want to go down. Uh, Dr. Gersh, how many times a year do you do uh, do you do the five day Prolon? Um, I try to do it four times a year. You do it four, okay? Because I, I do it twice. I, I wanna, I, I wanna up it to three times a year. Uh, but I was just curious, how many times do you do it? Well, well, we're different. Number one, I know I'm older than you, and I'm a menopausal. Wo- I'm a menopausal woman, and I really am fighting to stay super healthy. And I, I am, you know. So I want to 
Uh, I want to defy nature. Nature says once you're a non-reproductive female, like, you know, like, well, have a nice life, but, you know, you're on your own. You know, we're taking away your estrogen. Go fend for yourself. So, you know, I'm I'm doing everything to sort of counter nature's plan, which is like, you know, we don't care about you anymore. You know, so we want to trick ourselves. And my philosophy is that each of your cells of your body doesn't really think about like how old you are. It, it has the genetics to do whatever it's programmed to do, right? So if you give it the foundation that it needs to do the jobs that it needs to do, it's just going to do it. So if you maintain physiologic hormones, if you maintain the proper nutrients, if you actually activate autophagy and these processes that we need to go through to maintain healthy cells so we get rid of the old junky synesthesia in cells and, and so forth, so that and we rejuvenate the good cells. So if we can go through these processes and we maintain the environment, the ambiance of the cell with the nutrients and the hormones, then our cells can function quite well. We can never replicate an ovary once it sort of goes down the tubes after menopause, but we can come closer. We can at least do better. So we're not going to stop aging, but maybe we can slow some of the relentless negatives that are associated with it so that we can have this wonderful thing called health span where we live every day of our lives right up to the end having full capabilities to live and love and and dance and travel and do all the wonderful things we want to do and so we we just need to access all the tools at hand and and this is one of my key ones so that's why I do it more than you because I'm older and I need more more help <laughs> uh, as as I mentioned uh the the, the prolon links will be will be in the show notes. 10% discount code is capital B, capital Y, capital W, capital G. For single kits and for subscriptions, again, it's capital B, capital Y, capital W, capital G, little s for subscriptions. Uh, I, like I said, um, I do it twice a year. My wife does it twice a year. I've had several patients run through it as well. Huge, huge fan. Uh, Dr. Gers, two final questions. One question I ask every single guest um, from waking to sleeping, what is your daily rhythm and routine? And if somebody wanted to get in touch with you, what is the best way? Oh, okay. Well, my life is much better now than it used to be. I, I practiced obstetrics for 25 years, so I had massive circadian rhythm dysfunction because I was running around doing deliveries in the middle of the night many, many nights uh, each week. So now it's a lot more normal and lots healthier for me because unfortunately I, I nobody could live that lifestyle forever and and come out whole so i did have to give up obstetrics for my own health and so my day now is i get up pretty early and I chat with my husband and I have a nice big breakfast because I do believe that breakfast is very key. I look at all the data and people who have a good breakfast have less atherosclerosis and tend to have um, more weight control. So I like that. And then I go off to, uh, on when I'm home because I do travel a lot and I speak a lot. But when I'm in home in my office, I do go to my office and I start seeing patients uh, usually by 8.30 every morning, between 8 and 8.30. And then, uh, honestly, I see patients one after another all day. And then I do have a, a little break for lunch, and I have almost no lunch. I try to eat virtually no lunch. Um, I'm now eating the fast bar, which is yeah. the new uh, development. Yeah, so I Me eat too. my fast bar yeah. for lunch. I have, okay. the, I have we have I have it for I have it for breakfast, basically. A little different, but I I, I really I yeah. think that is an an extremely enjoyable. I'm a big fan of bars, and I try to find the highest quality bars that I can. And I absolutely love the fast bar. <laughs> absolutely. Yeah. So I do. Yep. Yeah, so we're the same, and I so I do that, and then I you know catch up on calls and such. I see more patients, and then um, I usually do some telemedicine calls at the end of my day. So I have a very long day when I'm working. So I usually don't get home. Um, and so this I don't recommend for people because I do have a very long day because I have to take care of my patients and, and I do travel. And so I have to make up for it when I'm home by doing these late days. So by the time I get home, it's, it's typically uh, 
between 6.37 or so. And then, you know, so I, I have dinner later than I like, but I try to finish by 8, you know, even though it's better to finish by 7. And uh, fortunately, my husband makes dinner. I'm not a very good cook. In fact, I'm a terrible cook. My kids always laugh about that still and, and talk about my vegetable goulash, which was not very good. <laughs> so and then uh, and then I um, I usually work, to be honest. I, I wish I didn't have to work so hard, but because I'm writing books and I'm creating slide decks and I'm always researching, but I actually find it fun. I find trolling PubMed, <laughs> which I'm looking at all the research articles to actually be quite fun. It's, I, I feel like I'm a medical detective. And then I also have another sideline business, which um, is I'm a forensic medical expert. And I got into that because my parents were lawyers and my dad said, you know, you can't have a functional legal system if you don't have honest, qualified, talented experts. So I work on a whole array of different kinds of medical cases. Like I'm a medical sleuth. I'm, you know, looking into cases to see what happened, all kinds of medical issues. I've worked on environmental health issues like land use where they've, uh, people had suddenly, um, uh, oil coming up in their backyard, but not to, not to, to make money off of it, like it was a previous land use where it used to be an oil field, and they have oil fields in Los Angeles. Um, so, you know, I've done all kinds of different cases involving pharmaceuticals and devices and uh, accidents. So that's, uh, I have to work usually a little bit at night on some of my forensic work. And uh, maybe watch a tiny bit of television, <laughs> that's about it. And then I'm going to sleep. And I wear a sleep mask because it's really it's a tremendous benefit for me for sleep because I can't get the ambient room light out enough. So I have too much light coming in no matter what I do. So I wear a sleep mask, which is fantastic. And what I do is I take it off away for, before I actually open my eyes and I let the light come in in the morning through my eyelids. So it's sort of like a dawn simulator. And, and then I get up and I start all over again. Yeah, I think you need to get a little busier, Doc. Oh yeah, that's true. <laughs> and then uh, right. Well, I'll be. Um, let's see. Well, this will of course be. Well, this will be in the past. But um, I have um, trips coming up. I'll be speaking in Toronto next weekend, and the weekend after that, I'll be in Scottsdale speaking at the Environmental Healthcare Symposium. So, I. But I love. I love my opportunities to speak and meet people, and uh, so, you know, I, I blend all of that together. We can talk about a different schedule, and I'm on the road. And in terms of finding me, I'm very findable. Um, I don't think there's any other replications with my other people with my name out there, but I have um, my practice, which is Integrative Medical Group of Irvine, where I, I see real people and I function as a real working doctor, you know, like a, a working doc. And so my office is in Irvine, California, for people who actually want to come and see me in person. And then in terms of like seeing some of what I do, you can go to my little personal website, which is Felice. L, for some reason my middle initial got into it, so it's FeliceLGershMD.com. Well, that's great. What an absolutely fantastic interview. Thank you so much. I really appreciate your time today. Well, it's been a pleasure, and I look forward to future encounters. Yeah, without a doubt, 100%. That's, that's a done deal. Uh, my name is Dr. Noah DeCoyer, your co-host, and you are listening to the Beyond Your Wildest Genes podcast. If you like what you've heard today, please share this with your friends and encourage them to subscribe on iTunes. Leaving a review on iTunes would be the icing on the cake. You can subscribe to our incredible weekly email at www.beyondyourwildestgenes.com. Don't forget to check out our newly released BYWG supplement line. The links to the book, Prolon, will be in the show notes. And as I always finish every interview I do, uh, thank you, and as my oldest son Hayden says, be awesome and never unawesome.